Alright, hello everyone. Uh, this is Yasengrin back again, doing a slightly different thing than I have done for the last couple of videos. Uh, instead of doing a replay review, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about deck building. Um, someone else, uh, I believe, oh, I should have looked up his name before I started recording. I want to say David. Uh, yeah, David M. in Green Level Clearance also did a very similar video that I was uh, prepping at the same time. It's in the Green Level Clearances Discord in the Resources channel. It just got pinned. It's a very good document I'd recommend going look at. Um, but I figured I'd put some time into this ahead of time, so I would go ahead and still do it anyway. Uh, so this is going to be hopefully 30 minutes or so about just how I think about deck building. Um, and it's I guess when I'm talking about deck building a Netrunner, I'm talking about the process of making the first draft of a deck. If you're trying to make a deck really competitive, there's a whole kind of second step after you've built a deck that I think of as tuning, where you try and uh, swap individual cards or small sets of cards in to make a, li a little more competitive. This is really going to be aimed at the first round pass, and how to get the best deck you can um, knowing not that much about the card pool, not that much about the meta, um, sort of from scratch how you would go about deck building. However, my first piece of advice for those of you who are getting into deck building, if you're very new to the game, I actually would recommend that you net deck, as in you take a deck that someone else has built with the current card pool you're looking at, and do that instead of building your own deck for the very first time. Now I'll say, this is not the advice I took when I was learning Netrunner. I think very few people do take this advice, but I think if you're trying to get an understanding of the competitive scene of Netrunner, if that's really your goal, the best thing you can do is net deck. Trying to reverse engineer other Netrunner decks from, you know, your knowledge from other card games can sometimes lead you down weird roads. Um, and Netrunner is a very complex game because your cards are not the limit of of what you can do in your turn they're the start of what, or they're like uh augments on what you can do on your turn um and netrunner decks that are good like help you learn how to win every card in them because the decks are small and uh you know most cards are very narrow they make they sort of just tell you what to do to win the game but bad decks often don't do this bad decks I've made, bad decks I've seen people bring to casual nights or even to tournaments or just wherever, often end up kind of feeling like a morass of doing something that's not really Netrunner, but it's on the card, so people end up doing things and then getting frustrated when they're not winning and not understanding why they're not winning. Every long-standing Netrunner player has a story where they came in and a new player showed up with a deck that just wasn't very good, um, and then the so the new player's deck got beat by this veteran then the veteran swapped the decks and beat the new player by just not playing most of the cards in the new player's deck and netrunner is particularly at, the, at this moment in time could be a little prone to having a lot of cards that seem good but maybe don't work as well as you would hope they would um, and so that's one of the reasons i recommend net decking and then the other thing is net Net Runner snowballs in ways that feel very different from a lot of kind of dude bashing regular card games. And so having a bad deck is just setting you back on this cliff that it can feel impossible to get up over. If your deck only has sure gamble as its only way of making money, you're just not going to beat most decks in the meta. Um, and that's a mistake that you can make if you don't know what you're doing. Now, you don't have to go all in of just copy and pasting someone's deck. You can, and I'll show you how to do this, uh, do some searching and just get some say like, oh, I like this card and I like this identity and let's see what decks are out there. Or you can take a really well performing deck and say, I don't really like this card or I want to swap it, I want to put this card in and just swap in some things in and out to get a sense for how your favorite card works in the context of a deck that's already a well oiled machine. Um, and, bef and finally, lastly, before I really get into this, I, because this is a slightly more beginner-focused video, I want to make sure I cover the deck building rules. Every deck must have an ID that's associated with it. All, I, you know, all runner IDs look like this, corp IDs look very similar. 
Um, every ID tells you the minimum deck size um, on the Nisi IDs, it's in the bottom left, and influence limit, which I'll talk about in just a second, it's all the bottom right. On the FFG IDs, these are both on the bottom right in a stacked order. Um, deck size is the minimum number of cards that you can have in your deck. Um, and I didn't list the other important deck building rule, which is you can only have up to three copies of a card. Unless specified otherwise, there are some limit six per deck cards and some limit one per deck cards in Netrunner at the time of this video being made. Then the other number is 15. This is the cost for uh, out of faction cards with an influence cost. Um, so uh, if you're criminal, every card with this symbol or every blue card is going to be, uh, and those are redundant pieces of information, are going to be influence free. You can include up to three copies of them in your deck, unless the card says otherwise. Uh, you can also include neutral, which are going to be white bordered cards, unless they have an influence pip on them. And when we're actually getting deck building, I will show what an influence pip looks like. The other major restriction is that corp decks must contain a number of printed agenda points on agenda cards in the deck. So in a 40 to 44 card deck, you must have 18 to 19 points, 45 to 49 must have 20 to 21, and a 50 to 54 card corp deck must have 22 to 23 points, and you can extrapolate from there. Okay, so when we think about deck building, I think there are three main questions you should be able to answer at any point in time, and that you should be answering throughout the process of building your deck. The first question, and the most important question, is how do you win? You may think this is an easy thing. Obviously, I would know this whenever I'm building my deck. You'd be surprised how many people forget about this during the process, and we'll, show, we'll talk about some ways about how they can do that. The second question is how can you afford your game plan, or how do you pay for this? Um, this is the sort of, you know, uh, Netrunner inherits a lot from the sort of Euro game uh, board game space where a lot of it is about making an engine and doing things efficiently enough to win a game. And so, um, oh boy, what's going on? Um, my slides seem to have just changed on me for no reason there. Uh, making that work. And then finally, how do you adapt from major threats from the other side? This last question is the one that takes the most meta knowledge and the most experience to answer. Um, and is the one I would worry about the least if you're a new player, but it's also kind of the one that ends up can can end up making a big edge in the final uh, process. Um, but we'll talk about some major threats to think about, and the decks I'll talk about and go through later are all startup focused. So I'll talk about, or I will try to talk about the meta that is in startup. Um, fine. When you think about building a deck. Ah, this is really weird. Ooh, okay. Um, you can think about constructing a deck both top down. This idea, when I think of top down, you're starting with a high concept. I want a deck that's going to go fast. I want a deck that's going to kill the runner. I want a deck that's going, you know, I want a runner deck that's going to mill out the corp. Or I want a deck that wants to make it so the corp can never score out of their scoring remote. Um, there's a lot of these sort of things where you're sort of trying to imagine a game you're trying to imagine a game state or a, an engine that you you know a big broad outside of the game concept it's not tied to a specific card it's tied to an approach to the game um, and I think a lot of very successful Netrunner decks are built top down I think a lot of the world's winning decks are the other sort of deck list I think of is kind of bottom up I like this card I like this interaction between these two cards I like this suite of icebreakers and I want to make them shine as much as possible so I call that bottom up deck building um, and this is sort of I think where I started and where a lot of people start with building Netrunner decks is you take your favorite card and you try and make it work and often uh, this ends up making a sort of what's often called a jankier deck a deck that doesn't work quite as well but I think there are also cards at the time of this decks at the time of this recording, like Hive Mind Max, which is a, a big meta force right now, that was probably built, or that you can build from sort of a bottom up set of principles where you like a set of interactions. Um, in that case, you're like, oh, okay, um, you know, I 
the way that hive mind and fermenter, which uh, interact together. Um, I'm sorry for not having this up on screen, uh, but hive mind basically says click trash gain two for every hosted virus counter, and hive mind says virus counters on this card are considered to be on all of your installed viruses, um, and so there, in you know, when hive mind the hive mind the virus counter that comes in on hive mind also gets counted when you trash to take the money off fermenter but doesn't actually remove that virus token and then ends up having a lot of small synergies uh, across that whole deck um, and there's another video on my channel that I would recommend to go watch about the hive mind max um, but that you can that deck you can build up from bottom up and a lot of that deck is built from bottom up sort of small interactions that you want to make shine but for both these philosophies you have to be answering the three questions of how are you going to win how are you going to afford your game plan? And how are you going to adapt to the major threats from your opponent? How are you going to deal with the disruption? So I want to actually talk about this in practice. So I'm going to do two examples that I've sort of pre-made. Um, one from the corp that we're going to do sort of a top-down approach. And one from the runner where we're going to do a bottom-up approach. Um, so for my corp philosophy, I'm going to be trying to say I want to make a corp deck in startup format that's just trying to go fast. I want to win the game by turn 10. Um, so if that's my goal, um, now choosing the IDs, there it's a little bit harder to filter by startup, but I'll show you how you can do that in um, in the deck builder. So we've got Wayland built to last. We've got, um, where is it? Uh, the Building a Better World. We have also Earth Station. We've got, uh, I, I'm not gonna actually go through all of the IDs. We have a long list of IDs. We could look at something like, um, in Startup, we could look at, oh my goodness, why am I just whiffing on everything? Where are we? Has, so like we could look at Has Byroid Precision Design, uh, which has text about scoring agendas. We could probably also look at um, near Earth Hub, which says when we create remote servers, we're drawing cards so that will that would help us go fast. But when I think about going fast, one of the big limits on is that you cost money to to start scoring your agendas. And to me, I look at built to last, and it says, "Ooh, whenever I advance cards, I gain two. And then, as we're going to talk about, as I go to think about agendas, um, Wayland is really well positioned to go fast. Uh, while not losing too much tempo in uh, startup. So let's quickly show, so this is the Netrunner DB deck builder. Um, if you want to build in startup or any other format, what you can do is you can go over to collection, you can select your packs and there's some pre-selects. So I'm going to select startup because that's what we're doing in this setup. And you can do all sorts of things to start when you're thinking about building a corp deck. I often do like to start with agendas first. So it's pretty, you know, helpfully selected agendas for me. We're going to select Wayland and Neutral because whenever you're building a corp deck, the agendas don't have influence costs. There's no um, there's no pips anywhere on this card, so you cannot splash it out of faction. So as Wayland, I can only run Wayland agendas or Neutral agendas. Um, so when I'm looking at agendas, I've got actually a relatively small list in startup. And this is one of the great things about startup is it's a much smaller place to start with deck building. So if I'm thinking about scoring, I want one way we could think about going fast. And I think it ends up being a very convenient one is thinking about, I want to spend the fewest clicks as possible to get as many points as I can. And so we have a mix of stuff. We've got three, three advancement requirements for two points. We've got four advancement requirements, three points, which is very good. We've got four for two, three for one, and we also should have two for ones. And so um, when we're thinking about agenda suites, two for one is a really big deal because I can you can install it, advance it twice, and score it immediately. So this is automatically a card I'm really interested in because if we're looking to go fast, this card not only is something we can score from hand the turn we draw it it's also something that's going to give us money when we do score it so that's fantastic um, 
but now we've got a lot of options um, and I'm gonna just you know um, we have a lot of things we could think about we could think about the the things that you know when we think about the next place to go three twos are going to be one step harder to score than two ones um, and they're going to take us four actions, one to install, and then three advancements to score. Now, that I know, because I've played a lot of the game, uh, there are tools that help us do that all in one turn, which is a great option. The other nice thing about them is that we can spend fewer clicks to get those points. So let's, you know, Wayland has access to a bunch of three twos that we could put in. So let's put in Above the Law, which is a one of, it's a three two and three Project Atlases, which is another 3-2. That brings us up to 11 of our 18 points. So now we have to figure out what we're going to do with the rest of our points. Um, so um, the, we, have, you know, we have seven points left. Um, we've got a lot of options. Cards I look at, so we've got stuff, we've got like Cyberdeck Sandbox, uh, Offworld Office and Oaktown Renovation all score us money. And all of that sounds good to me because remember the second question is how are we going to pay for this for stuff? And one of the ways we can pay for stuff in Startup with this deck is actually by scoring our agendas. Um, so let's say we put in three Oaktown Renovations, we put in one Offworld Office, and now we're at 19 agenda points, which, you know, really means I would rather be at 18, so there's fewer ways for me for the runner to steal. Um, and so that takes me to 10 agendas. So I intentionally did not look at some cards like Superconducting Hub or um, False Lead or um, there's one other, uh, those sorts of agendas, uh, a Divested Trust. All of these three ones have the significant disadvantages. So I'm spending as much effort as I would to score a Project Atlas or an Above the Law, but they're paying off fewer points. And so with this agenda suite that I have, these 10 agendas, any basically any four of them I score, as, unless I score two hostile takeovers, will get me to seven points. And the winner also has to steal four agendas from me. If I add more three ones, that's more frequently I'm going to be having to score a five agenda points to win, which is just not very good. So if I'm putting a three one in, it's both slow because it's going to take a whole turn to score the agenda, a whole turn plus an extra action to install it. Um, and I only get one point out of that. So I really do have to get a lot of value out of the agenda. And none of these three ones do that much, uh, sorry, that much for me to actually go and win the game. Um, and I don't really like putting in five threes, like send a message uh, or SDS drone deployment, um, because it then it's going to, most likely, if we're going fast, that means the ice we have is going to be less taxing, which means it's going to be easier for the runner to get in in a lot of cases which then means that we will have a hard time scoring five threes, but we won't make these five threes that much harder for the runner to steal. And then the runner only has to steal three agendas instead of four, which is a big cost to us. Now this may not be right. It may turn out down the road that we want some of these five threes, or maybe we want some of the three ones. Um, but this is kind of the way I would start thinking about things. So. The next thing to think about is, okay, so I've got all of these three twos. Maybe it would be nice if I didn't, if I could get around protecting them for a turn. Um, so there's two sort of main cards um, that do this in startup. One of them is Sans San City Grid, which says each agenda, the root of the server, gets minus one advancement requirement. And the other one is why is it not showing up what oh i didn't select hp that's why biotic labor which just says spend four credits and because it's an operation it costs a click to play gain two clicks 
So then after playing Bionic Labor, you'd have four clicks left, so you could install, advance, 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 and score any of your three twos. Um, now again, we're trying to go fast, and so I'm going to assume that you know we can't protect the Sand Sand City Grid for that long, and it costs more credits to use than the Biotic Labor. So let's put in some Biotic Labors. Um, let's see. Um, so let's start with two, and we can always change this number later as we go to build. Um, so as I was saying, I've been talking a lot about my ice, but I haven't put any ice in yet. So if I'm trying to go fast, what I want is ice that the runner has to go and get ways to deal with. So some cards in particular are ones that say, and they'll run on them. So ice wall is a quintessential example of a great piece of rush ice. It costs me almost nothing to res this, right? One credit's pretty cheap. But the runner is going to get past it for the rest of the game pretty cheaply once they have a way to deal with it. This is sometimes what you'll be you'll hear call a gear check, which is a I believe a term from MMO uh, parlance, but basically means the runner has to find a solution to this, uh, usually their barrier breaker, to handle this. And until they get the barrier breaker, Ice Wall is going to do a great job of keeping them out. Um, let's see. So uh, let's put in some Ice Walls. I'm going to put in two Palisades. I like Palisade. It's sort of positional. I'd almost always rather have this on a remote server than in a central, so we'll just go and put two of them in because two is a good number for things you generally want to see once per game. Uh, by like the middle, early to middle game, um, three is generally like a, I want to see this and I'm happy to put it, I'm happy to see multiple copies of it. Um, Enigma. So we have two barriers to end the run. Now we definitely want a code gate that ends the run. Enigma seems very good for that. Um, let's see. Um, but, you know, eight ice is definitely not enough. So let's look a little more expensive. Hortum is another great four cost end the run um, code gate. Um, so we'll put two of these in. Again, we're trying to be, I, the hypothesis I'm going in is I want to go fast and that means I don't want to spend a lot of time making money. So the cheaper my ice is, the better. You know, I'm, if I'm trying to win on turn ten, I can only, you know, I'm going to spend, you know, four turns scoring agendas, and so that only gives me six turns to make money and install ice. So I want to be very cheap in all of my things. Um, now we get to, you know, this is a good set of barriers and code gates. Now we want to put some sentries in. There's not a lot of great sentries uh, to choose from. We've got Winchester, we've got Trebuchet, we've got Tithe, and we've got Ballista and Archer. Now, I would like Archer as a 1x because it's a really strong piece of ice in startup. A lot of runner rigs are going to struggle to handle this. Um, and we have two hostile takeovers that we can forfeit pretty cheaply. We can forfeit other cards in other situations if it wins us the game, but we don't want to run res, run more archers because it's going to be ice that we often cannot afford to res or isn't is not worth it to res. So we probably want you know two more sentries, and when I look at this, we have ballista, we have trebuchet, uh, Winchester, and uh, tithe, right? Um, these are all influence free. We could look at influence sentries, but I'm going to not for the time being. Um, oh, I also forgot Colossus. Um, now, something of a trap that you can fall into is saying, oh, well, Wayland Built to Last says whenever you advance a card, gain two if it has no advancement counters. So cards that I want to advance should be great. And while that Colossus is advanceable, it doesn't do that much when you advance it once, right? It goes from a strength six to a strength or strength four to strength five. That's not that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things, and you're spending, you know, a click to gain a credit. So you're kind of clicking for a credit and increasing the strength of your sentry by one. That's just not doing that much. And while you know giving the runner a tag can be fun, we're not going to be putting tagging card tag punishment cards in this deck. And trashing one program is nice, 
but it, we can't score behind the Colossus because if we install this, the runner runs it, and we res we spend six dollars to res this Colossus. The runner can just let all the subroutines fire and then continue past the Colossus and steal what's ever in the server behind it. Um, so we, if we're really trying to tune our ice to be good on its own, when the runner, you know, in the first couple of turns, Colossus is not great there. Colossus is really going to be better towards the end of the game. So when I describe that, Ballista starts to seem a lot more appealing because if the runner runs it and they don't have any programs installed, I can just use it to end the run. Or if they've got, you know, if I think they're only on two barrier breakers and I see one in the discard pile and one installed, I can probably win the game by just trashing, by using the trash subroutine on Ballista. So Ballista is expensive, it's five cost, um, but sometimes it's going to be really good and other times I'm just going to discard it. Um, and I actually, looking at my notes, I actually put three of them in, which is probably too many. That's the thing we'll, I'll have to find out as I play more. Okay, so I've now got an ice suite, 14 ice. I've got an agenda, I've got a suite of agendas, and I've got some ways to score those agendas. And the way I'm thinking about the biotic labor is there are my ways to finish out the game. All of this ice, I'm going to try and score out my first five points with. Then I can use a biotic labor to get my seventh, my sixth and seventh point. So, um, you know, turn one, I can do something like install an ice wall, install an, you know, a project atlas behind it and advance it one time. And then if the runner doesn't have a way to get in, I get to score the atlas next turn. And then, you know, I keep doing that. Or maybe I use an Oak Town renovation to just gain a ton of money as I'm advancing and going. Um, so um, if we're trying to go this fast, we need to see, you know, probably half or a little bit around that many agenda points in our deck pretty quickly. Um, so we've got two big options. Um, let's go operation. Uh, we have, can I just do a, well, so we've got sprint says draw three cards and shuffle two into R&D. The other one, of course, is Spin Doctor, a card that should probably be a three of in most corp decks. Um, so, um, you know, we can put Spin Doctor, we can put in three Spin Doctors, and we still have four influence left to spend, so let's put some Sprints in too, because Sprint will help us find cards we want, and if we have Ice in hand that we don't need, we can just shuffle it back in to make our HQ a little bit um, stronger. Um, so, oh, it looks like in my notes I actually go a little bit of a different way, um, but we'll just get back there. Um, what am I at? Do, do, do. Oh yeah, the other thing we want is to put some standard Econs in, so hedge funds. And the other one that's going to be very common in a lot of whale index is government subsidy. If you can hit 10 credits, this card is just better than a hedge fund. It gives you 5 credits instead of 4. Alright, so we're at 37 cards, we've got 2 influence still to spend. As a court player, you generally want to go to that minimum deck size plus 4, because uh, basically those 4 extra cards make it a basically add 1 to 2 extra accesses that the runner is going to need to get to win the game. And that ends up being more important than the slight amount of uh, inconsistency that you get as the court. Uh, but that's, this is a point that's still somewhat debated, and there are you know, there are maybe some corp decks out there that want to break that rule. Um, okay, so we've got two influence left. We've got uh, 14 pieces of ice, 10 operations, three of which gain money, one of which is for Dakar draw, two of which is for helping us score, and we've got three assets to help us kind of keep going. But you know, I'm trying to think, how do I win? How do I win? The, I win by going fast. Um, so a great card for going fast in startup is Predictive Planogram. Now, this card, I'm assuming I will only ever get to play where I get to choose to either gain three or draw three cards. 
But the nice thing is, a lot of the time I will want to be drawing three cards. That's going to be pretty good if I'm trying to dig for my agendas or dig for an ice to score behind the runner doesn't have a matching icebreaker. And sometimes, if I'm really desperately in need of credits, I can take the credits. So predictive planogram is really good. Um, I don't think there's any way to tag the runner in this suite of ice, but that's okay. Um, I think here, Predictive Planogram fits with our game plan of going fast or helping us pay for things. Um, so now we're sort of at the last five cards we want to put in the deck. And this is where you sort of can round things out a little bit. And we are having some knowledge of what the threats are can be really good. Um, so I put three Spin Doctors in because um, I think that Stargate, which... Uh, see if I can tab, uh, is one of the major threats in Startup, uh, as sort of is Imp. Um, so Stargate lets them access R&D and trash a card. Um, and then we also have Imp. We have System Update 2021. Um, also, this lets them trash cards. And we don't, you know, those are potentially threats for us. They can trash our biotic labor. So Spin Doctor will help us turn the, put those cards back in our deck. The other thing I'm worried about is Zaya, who is going to have a lot of money and it will have a Docklands Pass um, to help steal agendas out of HQ before uh, we can score them. And so when I look at all of the cards that are in the pool, um, Afshar stands out as a great piece of ice protecting HQ that no runner can really easily deal with. Um, and Afshar, so Afshar kind of punches above its weight for the same res cost as Enigma. Yes, it's lower strength, but it's almost always going to cost the runner two to break into H, two extra credits to break into HQ, which is very good. Um, the other card, so now I'm, but I'm at 41 cards. I'm a little bit stuck. I don't know exactly what I'm going to do to put things in. So one thing you can do is I can go assets, operations, and upgrades that are in Wayland or neutral and just sort of scroll through and go, does this help me go fast? Does this help me go fast? Uh, two meat damage, that doesn't really help me go fast. I'm not leveraging meat damage in any other way. So even though this card is really cool, because a lot of my time I will have servers protected by ice, it's not going to act. I'm spending a click, and they're going to do two damage, but I'm not going to kill them with this, so it's not going to do great. Same thing with clearing house. I'm trying to go fast. I'm not trying to go in advance, 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 for turn after turn after turn. This just doesn't make a lot of sense. I could look at a card like CSR campaign. When your turn begins, you may draw one card. And this is actually kind of interesting if we're thinking about going fast. I think the challenge is it's only got a trash cost of two credits. So it's often going to get trashed for us, or for, away from us. Um, and so, you know, we can keep going. And a petite card and pad campaign, there's lots of different cards. But ultimately, the card my note is telling me to go up. It was wall to wall. Why? Because it says draw a card, gain a credit, advance the place an advance token on a piece of ice. That's not too relevant. It basically makes our ice wall slightly better now. Then we can add this asset to HQ. So when we're ready to score as a single remote we're thinking about building, we can um, put this wall to wall back into our hand if we want to. Now, because we have this three of these wall to walls to take us up to 44 cards, I'm looking at my ice suite and saying, oh, you know what? Maybe some of these palisades and ice walls could instead be at, um, cats. Uh, because now I have a game plan where I could get three advancement counters on an Aket without having to spend too much of my own tempo. I could spend a single click to advance it once and then let two wall-to-wall -wall triggers score it. So let's take out two ice walls and try two Aket's in their place just to see how that feels. And so this could be, I think, a reasonable starting built-to-last deck whose whole goal is to just outpace the runner, just sprint past them with some very cheap ice. You know, nothing, none of the, you know, we've, we've got one, two, three, we've got ten ice that cost three credits or less, and then two ice that cost four, 
and then three ice that costs five. So we are very low on the cost curve, uh, which I think, yeah, so we can see our ice, you know, almost all of our cards are on this very cheap side, which is really nice for playing the game aggressively. And then we've got the uh, government subsidy to make a lot of money. Now we may find when playing, if you play this, and maybe I'll do a video later where I do play this deck, um, uh, that this deck just makes a lot of money and doesn't have a way to win. Or maybe this deck doesn't make enough money and we have to slow down and figure out ways to fit that in. Um, but this is sort of, you know, if we're going from a top down, the goal is we're going to make a fast deck. This is one way you can do it, where you don't pick an individual card or an individual interaction. We just sort of say, I want to go fast. How do I do this? Um, so, you know, uh, and I realize I'm already at 30 minutes. I was hoping to do both of, both decks in 30 minutes, but that's obviously was a mistake. Um, so I'm going to go in a different direction this time, and I'm going to go with one of my favorite cards in all of Netrunner, and I think this new art is just absolutely lovely, is Otman. Um, this card is a weird card. It is an icebreaker that plays by none of the normal icebreaker rules. Um, and it can be very, very efficient in the right situations and absolutely terrible in the others. Um, which I think is a very cool place to be. And I haven't seen too many people experimenting with Otman in Startup. It may not be very good in Startup, but I want to try and make this work. So how could we go about doing that? Um, okay. So, Otman is cool. What does, when I have a card that I'm like, I want to build around, you have to sort of think, well, how can this help me win? Well, the idea with Otman is I get, I get to save money on, uh, on breaking my ice because it's already at the right strength every time. So I want a deck that wants to run a lot and can run, it will run very cheaply once I get the Otmans down. So what cards really reward me running a lot? Well, two ones that stand out, and I'm going through this very fast because I know the card pool quite well. You're gonna have to probably, as I showed in the, um, just sort of filter through the cards as you're looking. So I see cards like Leech. The Leech does a, a two nice things for us. So um, it rewards us for running. It says whenever you place a successful run, or whenever you make a successful run on a central server, you may place one virus counter on this program. Um, and then you can use a host of virus counter to reduce the strength of a piece of ice you're encountering by one. So if I put three power counters on Otman, so it's strength three, and encounter a four strength piece of ice, I can use Leech to lower its strength from four down to three and then break it with my Otman. And so then I'm just, you know, if we were talking about Ballista, which we were doing just the other day, or in our other deck, right? I can break this five cost sentry for one credit if I have a leech with one counter and an Otman at three. And that's where the cool thing that Otman does is it can make some ice that would be really expensive very, very cheap. So that's really good. Another card that's really good if we're running a lot is, of course, Penny Shaver. Whenever we make a successful run, place a credit on this count on this hardware, and then click, place one credit on this hardware, then take all the credits from it. So now we have a little engine where we're running a lot, we're getting credits on Penny Shaver as we're running, we're getting virus counters on Leech to help us keep breaking ice with Otman, and then we're using Otman to keep these runs really, really cheap. So those are all across all three different factions. So, but that seems like a nice little core engine I would want to build around this aggressive runner deck that's you know punching it with a, a very small rig, just trying to get in places and and uh, get in. Um, other things that seem good if we're running a lot are cards like Dirty Laundry. It synergizes well with running. Um, but also a card like Conduit, because none of the cards we're talking about, 
our click to run ability so we can use abilities like conduit where we get to make a run on R&D and then see additional cards on R&D and hopefully Otman is going to deal with one of the major problems with conduit which is often that it's very very expensive to run R&D multiple times Otman is supposed to solve that problem um, so if we're looking at conduit and Otman and penny shaver and leech that's starting to look like a nice little core package that we're thinking about so now when I go to build a new deck. Um, I have my choices of IDs. And I've listed, a, you know, Otman as a Shaper card, so one of the first places you could look at is Tau. And Tau has a really nice interplay with Otman where you can swap ice when agendas get scored so that you can line them all up. But I want to be a little bit quirkier. I'm going to go with Zaya because Zaya is all about running a lot and running the centrals a lot and making that cheap and efficient um, and we can just barely fit the influence in the package um, and there are also some other nice things so you know we'll, we'll start by putting in our Otman's our conduit oops our conduit and we'll probably want some leeches and that's all 15 of our influence spent and we've put six cards in the deck. But there's a really nice card that Criminal has access to, which is Boomerang. And this will help us deal with problem ice early in the game when we don't know what strength we should be setting our Otman at. Or if we haven't found our Otmans yet, this Boomerang could be really, really helpful with getting through stuff early. So we'll just start by putting three in. Another card that can help us with this is Inside Job, where we get to bypass some ice. So now we have this idea of, okay, we're going to have a really good, efficient late game engine with Otman and Leech, and we have some tools to help us answer cores that are trying to rush. Um, so, um, oh yeah, and I also forgot Penny Shaver, the other great card that we want to have as our cornerstone. Now, I'm putting in these amounts sort of by guesstimate, right? Otman, I want to see an Otman very quickly. I want to see a lot, a leech pretty quickly. I want to see a conduit eventually. I want to see a penny shaver early. Every boomerang I draw is going to be great. Inside job is going to be a bit more of a situational card. So I can start playing with these. All right. Um, now with the corp deck, I didn't start with this. Or I didn't say there was a fundamental package. I think right now, the way that the runner game is set up you should always put three sure gamble, three dirty laundries, and three daily casts in every single runner deck. It's not my favorite thing to do in the game. There are decks where you can break this rule, but I think you are more often than not going to be right by always putting those nine cards in your deck. Um, okay. Um, so we've got 23 cards. We've still got some room to go, but we have a lot of influence still to spend. Well, um, you know, I as I was saying, we always want to be getting more money. Well, Bravado is another great infaction criminal card. I should click on it instead of just doing the hover over. That lets us gain even more money. We can run at stuff and bounce off of it. Uh, to f enforce corp reses, or in the late game, we just get make a ton of money running through some deep servers. Um, now, I want to start thinking about what can the corp do to me? And a lot of the stuff with Inside Job and Boomerang is sort of about dealing with, with rushes. But there also are some cards like Swordsman, uh, let's go to the system update, where it can trash you can, I can't use my Otmans on it because they are AIs um, so I need some other solution to this now I think in practice very few people are going to play Swordsman some people may play Wraparound which uh, also is very expensive to break with Otman if there's no Fractor installed and I don't have a Fractor on my list I just have Otman Wraparound would cost me a ton of virus tokens because I'm not really going to install an Otman at 7. Um, 
so excuse me there. Um, so I want to have a Fractor in my deck just in the off case where that happens, and maybe I want to have one Begalter in my deck just in the weird case where I run up with an opponent with Swordsman and I don't just lose the game. Um, let's see. That said, I think these cards likely are unnecessary, and you could probably put other things in, but for my first draft, I want to maybe be a little conservative. Other times, maybe I'll be a little greedy and a little aggressive, um, but it's, it's you know, these are fine cards to put in. Um, let's see. Where? Oh, what else? Um... Oh, we're also going to put in. I'm skip. I skipped around a little bit in my notes. I missed the section where I talk about econ. So I have security testings. Um, the other card you could look at is red team. The issue is red team has a very big upfront cost for this deck, and Ottman's cost you have to all pay upfront. You have to pay three, and then X for all of the strength. And you have to do this all at once when you start. You don't get to ameliorate this cost over the course of the game. Um, so having two ca cards that cost a lot up front is really tricky. Um, so I'm going to avoid red team and instead do security testing, which gives us fewer credits, but costs nothing to put down. Um, the other thing is that Earthrise, so we want to add some card draw. Basically every runner deck should have a good amount of card draw, because while the corp draws to go fast, they always are going to be drawing every turn. Um, but the corp gets to present problems, and you have to find answers. And that generally means you need to dig more than the corp does. So three or, or four Earthrise Hotels is very good. And then we also have the Class Act, uh, which is a very good criminal card. One thing to note about the Class Act, it's unique, so you can only have one installed. But if you do have one installed and another one in your hand, you can actually install the second one, and then as you're installing the second one, the game state, uh, you get to trash the first one. Normally you cannot trash your own resources, um, but the game state basically says, oh, you can't have two unique cards installed. Which one do you want to keep? Um, and you get to keep the newer ones so that you get the effect of the, uh, on the turn during uh, which you install this resource ends, draw four cards a second time, which makes the class act very, very good. Um, all right. Um, let's see, let me just check my notes. Um, okay. Uh -huh. Okay, so some other cards we could look at. Sorry, I, I've lost my notes a little bit, but I know what the deck looks like, and we can kind of reason it out. So Mutual Favor is also going to be nice here because it helps us run, and it helps us find the Ottman if we're looking for it. Um, another card we are going to want is probably Docklands Path. It would be nice to have some HQ pressure to go along with our Conduit on r and I'm only going to put one in. Maybe the right answer is you want two of these, and you cut some other cards. Um, and then another card, actually... I'm going to cut this Mutual Favor back and also put in Jailbreak. Jailbreak does some nice stuff for us here where we get to see an additional card, which will give us more credits. It'll also draw a card. Um, so it does a lot for us. Now, this is sort of, I think, actually a very nice first draft of the deck. I want to quickly take a, a side tangent to talk about something that you may notice. I have... If we're counting that I'm going to need to have a couple of copies of Ottman installed, let's say two, a copy of Leech, a copy of Conduit, I then don't, that's four MU, and then I'm going to have one Begalter, one Marwana, and one Ottman competing, that's three MU competing for only one MU left that I'm getting from Penny Shaver. That's okay, because all of the, the third Ottman, the Begalter, and the Marana are all kind of utility programs in this deck. And you don't need to have a you don't need to plan to have all of your utility programs down every game. And I could even think about putting a sneak door beta in. Um, 
And in fact, maybe we should. Maybe we can find a we can find a card to cut because this also fits with our game plan of running archives, making the corpse spread out their ice so that our Otman continues to get value and go in cheaply, and our leech continues to generate us value, um, and puts down some HQ pressure. So we'll find a card that we want to cut. You know, maybe we cut this last mutual favor. We've got three copies of Ottoman. That really should get us a lot of the way there. Maybe we'll find out later. Oh, I never played the Sneak Door Beta. It's not very good. Or maybe the MU becomes an issue. Before I would put an MU card in your list, I would look at the cards you're putting MU in for and try cutting the weakest MU using card first. Um, because generally, MU is the issue of it's also a problem that you created for yourself. And so the you have to be getting a lot of value because you're basically dedicating two card slots to the value of one card, the program you're running. Um, and if a program is so valuable that it's worth two cards, you could probably just cut your next weakest program instead. Um, so generally I would advise against running plus MU programs. There are going to be exceptions to this, and you know, all the Shaper players can come and flame me later, but I generally say avoid putting plus and new cards that aren't really good consoles in your deck. But here we've talked about, and I think hopefully I've now demonstrated, how you can go from a bottom-up approach to get the same, I think hopefully, competitive deck. And I think probably in a future episode I will... Um, show these decks off and show how we can start thinking about tuning these decks after playing them once. Um, but I think I'm going to wrap it up there. Let's go back to my presentation. I've got one final slide. Um, dun, 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 dun. So my takeaway messages from this, what I was hoping was going to be a 30 minute video, but it's probably going to be closer to an hour by the time this is done, is net decking, you know, four messages. Net decking isn't bad. It's one of the best ways to get better at Netrunner and to get better at deck building because you'll see what works and what doesn't work. Um, second thing throughout the whole process, you should only be taking cards that help you win. Not cards that make some of your cards stronger, which can feel like it's helping you win, but doesn't necessarily actually help you win. Um, an example wa um, from we were talking about was maybe some of the three ones in Built to Last, where something like, you know, False Lead or actually no, um, oh shoot, I'm forgetting the name of it because I I almost never play it. Um, the Wayland three one lets you forfeit an agent, forfeit it to basically shuffle the agenda of the runner would steal back into your deck. Um, that card, while it can feel really powerful. It doesn't actually help that deck win because you're spent a whole turn scoring it and then you're pr planning to shuffle it away and not have it be worth that many points. Um, or with the Zaya list, red team can feel like, oh, it may when I'm already up and running, I get to red team in and get three extra credits on a run. Um, but early in the game, it's going to be so expensive to put down along with your offense. It's just not really worth it. Um, so often, you know, I, as a uh, long-time Shaper player, I'm often very guilty of this, of saying, oh, I'm going to put in this card to make my Icebreaker even better, and then not, and then forget about the fact that I don't have any way to actually access more than one card at a time in the whole deck. And so the Corporation says, if the Corporation is not playing a nice heavy plan, I've just put a dead card in my deck. Um, or the Breaker was already efficient enough in its own, I didn't need to squeeze that extra small amount of efficiency into the card. Third message, put more money in. More money is always going to help you do well. And then the final one is you can deck build a lot of different ways. I showed two ways where I call a top down and a bottom up, but there are many more approaches to deck building. Um, and I think many of them can be successful in Netrunner. Um, so I encourage you to uh, enjoy and explore and um, you know, I think that's going to wrap it up for the deck building. Uh, I do, I think, plan on now making, so, doing some replay reviews of the startup matches. I think I don't love the, I'm just going to live commentate my game as much. Um, I think that's just, it's a different skill set to commentate live. Um, and while I don't, ha you know, don't have so much practice with, and I think uh, not as much my niche. Um, 
But if people do have replays of startup or standard, I'd love to start taking other people's replays and looking at them and, and to hopefully uh, helping everyone learn from them. Uh, and then I guess two other announcements. I'm running a tournament uh, in standard the on the 22nd of May, starting at 10 a.m. Eastern time. And another one two weeks later, so June 5th, that will be a startup format tournament. And I think for the startup tournament format, I'm going to be figuring out some way to do a prize raffle. Um, but more details on that exactly to come as I nail them down. All right, well, thanks for watching, and I hope this was a useful video. Uh,